son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles, the riddles of the wise. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Aren't you thankful to be in the air conditioning? Man, it is so stinking hot, and I've always said, fat boys love Freon. So um, it is good to be here. Can I get an amen? All right. Uh, hey, we're continuing our series, Word for the Wise, and uh, we're so thankful that you're here, that you have chosen uh, Upstate Church Five Forks. This is your first time. Welcome. We know it can be overwhelming, but my name's Dustin. I'm the campus pastor here, and being a pastor, I think one of the hardest things, um, this kind of lets you into our life, is really... Um, And having kids and in this parenting thing, being a pastor is not putting unrealistic or really unfair expectation on our boys because they're the pastor's kids. And we all know a joke that starts with the pastor's kids, right, or ends with the pastor's kids. And they act that way because they hang out with the deacon's kids. That's that's what we know. But um, we don't want to put these unfair expectations um, on our kids just because I'm the pastor and they're our kids and... And I think one of the things that Sloan and I, not to brag, but one of the things that we really valued as a family, um, as parents, is we wanted to teach our kids really how to articulate uh, the gospel, how to articulate what's in the Bible, how to articulate uh, this, uh, what it means to follow Jesus. Because we all know, and kids are infamous of this, um, what I would call the Sunday school answer to everything. Have you heard this? I mean, in the South, being um, in the Bible Belt, we probably have heard this, where the answer to every single question, or at least the Sunday school answer, is either one of three answers. God, Jesus, or the Bible. Have you heard that? Where you ask your kids, hey, you know, God tells us that we should treat people the way that we want to be treated. Do you know why that is? Jesus, all right? Or, um, hey, do you know how we grow closer to God, the Bible? And it's just one of those things. And if you think about it, and I'm not calling anybody out, but for many of us, especially if we grew up in church, we go through life in our faith and in our relationship with God, and we know the Sunday school answers, but that's really it. It really limits our faith. It really kind of handcuffs us in our knowledge. And before you know it, we um, are out of our parents' home or we become parents. We start a career. And really the level of our faith is only as deep as those Sunday school answers. And before you know it, we don't really know why we believe what we believe. And we really can't articulate what we believe. And so what ends up happening is we live in a culture where Christians do a lot of talking. They know the right answers to say and, and the right things to, to believe and to post on Facebook or whatever. But to me, there's this dichotomy or there's this disconnect in the answers we know and the things that we say versus the way that we live. And it, and it feels like Christians can do a lot of talking but we, we're, we have a harder time of actually doing the walking. You know what I'm saying? And, and I really do believe that this is one of the main reasons why people um, that grew up in church turn away from the faith or, or aren't interested in being a follower of Jesus whatsoever because they have a relationship with or have an experience um, in their life with somebody who is, says, hey, I'm a Christian. Uh, I believe in Jesus. I go to this church or that church. But yet, there really is no uh, difference in their life than anybody else. That they can say this thing, they, they might even wear a WWJD bracelet, throwback, all right, or um, post something on social media. But then when the rubber meets the road, they can do all the talking they want, but their walk doesn't match up. And people get that. People see the radar and say, well, what's the difference? If you're claiming Christianity and claiming that you are a follower of Jesus, I really don't see the difference. So why should I follow a God that's like that, that you claim is about life transformation? I really am not 
seeing that. And so imagine if our words actually became a faith, a living faith, that, that we put some feet and we do some, we do some walking opposed to um, just talking. And this morning, we're going to look at two passages really related um, to Foster Care Awareness Month, but even bigger picture to us as believers that call our faith into action, where there is no excuse to just talk a good talk, but we have to start walking the walk. And so if you were here last week, we're going to be in Proverbs 31 again this morning, so you can go ahead and turn there into, uh, in your Bibles or on your phones, they'll also be on the screens, but we started this series called Words from the Wise because the book of Proverbs is considered wisdom literature. And the reason that is is because the main writer is King Solomon, who we see in Scripture asked for God's wisdom, and God granted it, making him the smartest man um, to ever live in all of history. And the book is full of incredible just little uh, segments and passages and different things that really point and reflect the heart of God and point to God's wisdom in and of itself. And so as believers, and really even non-believers, that you might think, well, this is irrelevant, there is so much wisdom in here that we all should be leaning in and saying, okay, what does that mean for me in my life? And so let's look at Proverbs 31. Um, It's just two two verses this morning, Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. Okay, it says this. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. I mean, as believers, there is incredible wisdom in these passages that is using some strong language. The writer Solomon is saying, open your mouth. Now, you might have told your kids, shut your mouth. That's not what he's saying here, okay? He's saying, open it. There is some action that as believers, we cannot stay silent on issues and just sweep them under the rug, but we need to actually open our mouth. Who do we need to open our mouth to? It says, for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute, to judge righteously and defend the rights of the poor and needy. And what I love about this is this is a direct reflection of the heart of God. It, it is, it's, this isn't a live your best life now message and go out there and whatever. Man, this is a call to action. This is a challenge that's easier said than done. I get it. That even reading this, I, I'm challenged. We should all be challenged as believers to take a step in this to say, okay, I need to, I, I need to, to really open my mouth. And so there's two points this morning. And, and the first one that we see out of this is that in this verse, it's calling us to speak up for those who have no voice. That as believers, as a church, that if you are a follower of Jesus, that we need to speak up. We need to say something. We need to open our mouths. We um, we can't just stand by and stay silent, like I said. And I love this. I I really you can really see this in this incredible passage in Luke 8. And you can go back and read the story. But in Luke 8, Jesus is going to the temple. And this is in the height of his ministry, and he's walking, and Scripture says that the crowds are pressing in on him. So they know who he is. And I can only imagine in this moment that you see all these crowds coming in, knowing that Jesus heals, know that he's healed a blind man, a paralyzed man, all this other stuff. And they're coming in, and they're probably saying all kind of things to Jesus. Hey, can you come visit my sister? How about my mom? Or I'm dealing with this. And so they're starting to press in on Jesus. And in the crowd is this woman who has a medical disease where she's discharging blood. And she's done it in her entire life. Scripture even says that she spent all of her living going to physicians. So there is no cure. And she doesn't know what to do. She's poor. She's needy. She wants to be healed. She hears that Jesus um, and what he does. And she's in this crowd and so much so that she wants Jesus to heal her. But maybe because of the culture, you have to remember that when someone had a disease or a disability or some kind of medical problem like this, really they were disowned in the culture. 
They were looked down upon because, one, people looked at them and said, you have this problem, you have this disease or disability because of your sin. Aren't you thankful that we don't really look at people that way? <laughs> That's crazy. That they looked at him and said, because of your sin, God cursed you with this disease. You're paralyzed because of your sin. You can't see because of your sin. You have a blood disorder because of your sin. And so because of that, she was disowned. Because in the same way, people that saw people with diseases didn't want to be near them because of the fear that they would get that same disease. You can't touch someone who has leprosy because I'll get leprosy. Or, or that person, because of their sin, they're paralyzed because of that. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be associated with that. And so in return, this woman who had this blood disorder was the outcast of society. And on top of that, she was a woman. And in that culture, women had really no rights. And so she was just down and out. She didn't have a voice. She wasn't important. And then we see she's in this crowd, and I don't blame her. I would do the same thing. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be called out. So she sneaks up, and as Jesus is walking, she touches the, the cloak of Jesus. And it says immediately she was healed. And then we see in this passage, Jesus stops everything. And he asked the question, and I don't really know the tone. It's kind of like a text message that you get and you don't know how to read it. And in Scripture, there's really, you know, you don't see the tone in this passage. But Jesus asked, who touched my cloak? Now, I can assume, I don't believe that Jesus is like, who touched my cloak? <laughs> he didn't look to her or anybody and say, okay, you need to confess right now <laughs> because I'm Jesus and you're not going to touch me. He didn't, he didn't say that. But he says, he says, I know someone touched me because I felt the power of God leave me. Now that's powerful. We can't just overlook that. That the power of God was working through Jesus and went out to somebody. Now this woman, she could have just, it's almost like, you remember those days when you were called out in math class? And it's like, Dustin, how about you answer the question? I'm like, oh, I wasn't paying attention. Like I was just wiping the drool from falling asleep in math class. And you're like... Okay, or who did that? And you're kind of like, me, me. <laughs> you know. I, I almost feel like she, maybe out of shame or guilt or whatever, I probably wouldn't have spoken up. I probably would have just been like, I'm backing out of this crowd. But she comes forward. And the way that Jesus speaks up for the, for the woman who has no voice, who is down and out, he looks at her, and he could have said, why did you touch my cloak? You didn't come to me. Don't you see all these people asking me stuff? Take a, take a number. But he says, daughter, calls her daughter. And he says, because of your faith, you have been made well. Go in peace. And that's powerful. That is Jesus right there speaking up for the person who has no voice, who was destitute, who was down and out. And he spoke up for her. And if, you're, if we're real honest this morning, thank God Jesus spoke up because he spoke up for you and me. That our sin separated us from God. There was no hope. We had no voice. We had no say. There was no, I'm going to earn my way to heaven and I'm going to try to be good. It was Jesus and Jesus alone saying, the only way for you to get to heaven and spend eternal life with my Father is through me. So I will speak up. And I'm going to tell you, he spoke up loud and clear by dying on the cross, didn't he? I mean, that's speaking up. It wasn't just like, could you excuse him and her? Man, he gave his life and he said, God, I'll take care of this. I will speak up by my action of dying on the cross. That is powerful right there. That is Jesus' ministry. That is the gospel. You want something to articulate? Jesus speaking up for the vulnerable. Speaking up for those who had no voice. And we need to do that as believers. That we need to speak up to the people who have no voice, who are down and out, whether that is an orphan, whether that is someone that's in foster care. Can I tell you, you know, Sloan and I, um, our journey, every journey is a little bit different. I know Ken and Jessica and any of you who have fostered know this, but it's a long journey. And there's all kind of different angles and all, every, everything's a little bit different. But there are kids that move from home to home to home to home 
because they get to a foster care situation and it's just not healthy and people are like, I quit. I'm not, I'm not doing this. This isn't what I signed up for. And they go to another house and then they go to this house and that house and they just want somebody to come and help and this love on, on them and to care for them and to say, I'll speak up for you. Even in the midst of how, uh, however hard it is, the therapies, like I didn't even know, like when we adopted our kids or were fostering our three boys, like I didn't know that like a three-month-old, I think it was three months, maybe it was six months, had to do like food therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, like I needed to go to therapy, all right? That it, it's just crazy, the needs of this, but those, our boys, and this is just personal, needed somebody in their corner that was personal. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if I didn't have Jesus if I would have done that. But because Jesus was in my corner, in the lowest of lows, man, it's the least I can do to be a voice, to speak up for a kid that he, he, didn't, he didn't choose this life. And, and yet he needed someone in his corner. He needed mom and dad, or, or at the time we weren't even mom and dad, foster parents to step up and say, you know what? We're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus right here. And he's calling us to do that. But then we also see this challenge. Um, let, me, let me back up real quick. And the psalmist, David, writes this in 82.3. He says, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. There's that word destitute again. And really, if you look at the word destitute, if you look it up, it's really um, a lack of clothing, shelter, and food. That we need to be people that give justice. Not to say, oh, bless his little heart. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to stand up. We need to do something about it and speak up for those who have no voice. But then we see in, this, in the second part, verse 9 of this passage, where he says, Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. So not only do we need to speak up for those who have no voice, but we need to speak out for those who have no hope. And you might be asking, hey, well, what's the difference between speaking up and speaking out? I'm not really sure. It just sounded good, like, in the message, okay, when I was writing this. But I would like to think speaking up is using our words, and speaking out and defending the rights is more action. Putting uh, steps and, and hands and feet to just our words, and it's, it's really the, the walking that, that takes place here. And we know, as, I, as I've said, I mean, being Jesus to others, being Jesus to others is more than just talking. It's walking, right? That I can go around all day and say, I love Jesus. Put it, put it everywhere. Put up a nice, cute little verse on my social media and be like, isn't this this cute? And, uh, um, you know, and go to church and attend church and be volunteering and all that other stuff. But the truth of the matter is, that we have to put action, that people are watching. If we want to be Jesus to others, you probably have heard this, that a lot of times we're the only Bible that some people read if you're a believer or we're the only church some people experience. And unfortunately, let's be honest and be real, the church, capital C Church, all across America, some have done really good at this and others have failed miserably of not painting an accurate picture of the hands and feet of Jesus. And that all of us have probably had a bad church experience at some point. And, and that's what I love about this place is that we get that. And we don't want to be that church. Are we going to be the perfect church for anybody and everybody? Maybe not. Probably not. But we want to be the church that speaks up and speaks out. And at least uh, creates an environment where we can come and we can worship and learn and dig into and be Jesus to others. Because we are more than just talking. We are walking the walk. That's why we say we are four or five forks. We want to be for the community. We want to be, in the, uh, uh, we want to be for the, the poor and the needy and the destitute. We want to have the voice. I love this. Proverbs, earlier in the book, at the very beginning, the writer writes in uh, Proverbs 3, 27 and 28. Here's the action. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when you have the power to do it yourself. Do not withhold good. If you have the power to do it, you need to do something. And he says, don't say to your neighbor, hey, go and come again, and maybe tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. And we've all been guilty of that, to say, oh, maybe, maybe next time I'll give. Maybe next time I'll do this. 
And God says, no, if you have the means to do it, do it. Don't withhold good. Don't withhold um, showing Jesus to something that we need to do something. And honestly, as believers, we need to stop gathering around in the name of Jesus while we don't do anything else. We need to be able to help the poor, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, ser- uh, serve the least, um, to, to help speak out for the destitute, and speak up for them. We need to give hope, don't we? Because we have the greatest message of, of all. And sometimes by being a foster parent, taking care of the orphan, taking care of a widow, taking care of the poor and the needy, and those things in practical ways. Now, we don't need to go to them and say, you know why you're poor? Because you don't have Jesus. (laughs) Sometimes we need to feed them or give them shelter and meet practical needs. That's what we see Jesus do. He doesn't just go to them and say, oh, he didn't say to this lady, you know what, first, I need, you know what, you want to be healed of this this blood disorder, hey, just close your eyes and bow your head with me. Repeat this prayer after me. And if you raise your hand, if you really accept me, and now now, now you've got to have a quiet time, and now you need to go to church. Every, now, don't you miss more than 48 times out of 52 weeks, okay, because then your faith is null and void. No, he knew her heart, and he saw her faith. And I think we need to have that same faith, don't you? That we need to have the faith that sees Jesus And we are so desperate for him that we run to him. And it is only natural that when we run to him that we will reflect the heart of God and say, you know what, I need to speak up for those who have no voice. I need to speak out for those who have no hope. Now, I said this a couple weeks ago when the lawyer and the Pharisee asked Jesus, what is the greatest command? You've heard this before. He says, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But he says the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I said this, and I really do believe this, and maybe this is just God stirring something inside of me, um, you know, and and hitting me on the head, but that we're really good at loving ourselves. We're the first people to buy stuff for ourselves. But my question to you is how are you helping those in need? How are you stepping out of your comfort zone? And I'm not asking you, man, I, I would love And I know I have a biased opinion. I would love for more people to step up and be foster parents. I would. But I know that not everybody's called to do that. And so it it would be weird and wrong of me to say, every single person, you need to go fill that out right now. But maybe God's calling you to do that, and I applaud that. But maybe it's to support our forever family team. And just providing meals, providing gift cards, uh, supporting through prayer and and just different things of uh, different events that we host but let's take that out in our everyday lives we need to be more in tuned to stepping out and serving other people don't we because we can get so focused on just us that we need to step out and say how can I serve those in need who is someone at your job that man just by meeting a practical need you can show them Jesus before you even have to name who Jesus is, you just say, hey, I just want to help with this. That's what Jesus wants from us to step out and to have action that we can speak up and speak out for others and stop living just for ourselves because we can give hope. We speak out for those who have no hope because we have the message of Jesus. And I I don't know um, what you're thinking this morning. Uh, Maybe you're like, man, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up. Um, to be a foster care parent, or maybe you know somebody who really needs Jesus, and you just need to meet a practical need of theirs. But I will tell you this, each and every one of us, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, we need to be about other people. We need to speak out and speak up for other people because we have the greatest hope that can ev- we can ever imagine and if we just sit by and have this holy huddle every Sunday and say, man, my church, is, my church is good, I'm getting fed, but who cares about everybody else? And how selfish would that be? That Jesus, is one of his last words said, go and make disciples, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's why we exist as a church. That, man, it's been awesome to see the growth in this place. And if you've been checking us out the last couple weeks, I'm so glad you're here. 
We want to continue to reach Five Forks and to reach the upstate for people who need Jesus. We want them to connect with Jesus to change their world. And that starts with us speaking up and speaking out. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being a God that we can go to people. And you give us the heart as we see in the reflection of who you are in Proverbs. That God, we have the greatest hope ever. And we don't find it in money. We don't find it in stability of our job. We don't even find it in our kids, in our homes. But, God, we find it rooted in Jesus and Jesus alone. And so, Father, let us open our mouths for the mute. Let us speak up for those who are in need. Let us open up our mouths to those that have no voice and to, to provide hope for those who are down and out, just like that woman. And so, Father... Whether that's a next step of saying, you know what, it needs to start with me. I need to be baptized. Or I I just need a relationship with Jesus because I've been away from church for a long time. Or I've never been in church and I'm here because I, I feel like I need to be. But God, it starts with us knowing and clinging on that you are the hope of the world. But also for us that are our believers, that every day we look for opportunities to serve others. And maybe that's signing up this afternoon for a forever family and just saying, I'll help serve somewhere. I'll watch kids on a parent's night out or I'll help provide meals um, for a placement. Father, our very own. um, We have a family right now that's in Columbia, um, the country, (laughs) about to adopt uh, or finalize the adoption of some boys and bring them home. Let us wrap our arms around them. And God, but for everybody that is, has a physical need or spiritual need, God, I pray that we can be a church that loves them and loves them well. In your son's name, amen. Hey, let's stand up. Let's celebrate a good, incredible, and worthy God. That's a name above every other name that we can say that we can provide hope for other people and point them to this name that we're about to sing about. Let's, let's worship together.